Delighted to have Christina Oliver, the Director of the State Division of Housing and Community Development that monitors the Modern Income Housing Plan process. David Damshin, who's the CEO of the Utah Housing Corporation, a monumental effort there to, to help families get into houses. And uh, also happen to have Carson Eilers, who is here, uh, uh, plays a pivotal role with the League of Cities and Towns, as is needed a staff of people to uh, do the work of the Utah League of Cities and Towns with his finger on the pulse of what's going on on Capitol Hill. So without a whole lot more ado, let me turn it over to Christina to lead this conversation. The materials are online for those who uh, are visiting us with us online as well. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Craig, I appreciate it. Um, we have to be careful to talk in to our microphones today. We've been introduced, again, my name is Christina Oliver. I am the Director of Housing and Community Development. I'm just gonna go through some top level slides and we'll save the questions to the end if you don't mind. Um, and I'll just quickly roll through them. So the Commission on Housing Affordability, a few different partners have brought that up today. Three significant bills were the result of this commission. Um, the Commission on Housing Affordability is a commission that not only I sit on, but I also staff through the department. And there we go. I won't touch it. Uh, so, but Senator Lincoln Fillmore, Representative Stephen White, and Representative Joel Briscoe are our three legislative um, commission members on that particular commission. And they sponsored three particular bills, HB 364, which is the Housing Affordability Amendments, HB 406, which was briefly discussed earlier, the Land Use Development and Management Act modifications, as well as SB 174. And these are additional land use and um, development revisions. I want to talk a little bit about this moderate income housing report. Uh, you may or may not have heard about it. We have over 90 communities in the state of Utah that are required to provide a report to my office. We provide it in a form format, a Google form particularly. And municipalities are either required to choose three or five strategies to promote moderate income housing in their jurisdictions. Five, if you have a bus rapid transit, tracks, or front runner station. We also this year um, established an appeal board. So much to our um, disappointment this year, initially around 70% of the submitting municipalities failed. And the reason for this, it, the majority of the reason for this is because the strategies are very prescriptive. In HB 462, last session, I'm starting to get all my HBs and SBs mixed around. Um, the language was changed in the moderate income housing plan to be prescriptive because the previous three years were resulting in, in very little um, forward movement. So the strategies needed to be adopted verbatim. There was disagreement between various parties on that particular language in state code. So it was um, updated this year, but we worked with all of the municipalities very closely and I'm happy to say that only two of the jurisdictions were not eligible, did not pass compliance this year. So it's a learning curve, this is a new process. Is it the easiest process in the world? No, but we have a wonderful planner on staff and we work closely with the League of Cities and Towns to provide as many trainings, one-on-ones, uh, all the things that we can do to help cities come into compliance. Sorry, the appeal board. So rather than Christina being the judge and jury, which I was really worried about this year, because I hate that role, uh, we established a three-person appeal board and it is locally, um, the jurisdiction is local. So one person from the AOG, one person from the league, and one person from the Home Builders Association. And these appeals are final, but they, they, don't, they take me out of being judge and jury, which is a really, really hard place to be in. Um, there are three penalties. I only highlighted two. I'm gonna, Carson, do you wanna talk about the third one, the sales tax one? If you're, uh, which, are moderate you income the housing. EIP or the, like the uh, access to transportation funds? The third, the sales tax. I can talk about it a okay. little bit, okay. So non-compliance results in th now three penalties. Last year it was one. In 2022, all the municipalities had to do was um, choose the strategies and provide us with an implementation um, t 
timeline, which was specific and had benchmarks. This year, it's going to be more narrative. So the material that we're going to be receiving from the municipalities will include things like how did the market respond, uh, what steps have you taken toward the implementation of your strategy. A lot of uh, municipalities have come forward already and said, well, we didn't plan on implementing this strategy until uh, 2026. Well, you <laughs> implementing a strategy doesn't just take one day. There are steps. You have to have public hearings. There are a variety of things that you can do between now and then to further that strategy. So we're, we're working and educating our, our folks. And, and understandably, it can be a frustrating process. But again, it's a learning curve for everyone. So every best practice that we hear, we like to pass on to as many people as possible. But the three disincentives are uh, not being able to access your transportation and TTIF funds, which is not very great. Um, starting in 2024, if you're not in compliance, you will be charged $250 a day. Uh, that fee will increase the following year to $500 a day. If you, so the new timeline is you turn in the report August 1st and we have 90 days to review it. Then there's the appeal process and some other items. Regardless, if you are non-compliant, so as I mentioned, two municipalities were not in compliance this year, you will now be charged $250 a day until your next opportunity to turn in a moderate income housing report, which will be May 1 is when we are required to release the form. You're assuming we change nothing in 2023's form. In 2024, we could, for all intents and purposes, receive a new moderate income housing plan from someone who was previously non-compliant. If for some reason that same city is non-compliant a second year, the fee increases to $500 a day. Municipalities cannot be found in compliance regardless of your strategy, implementation towards your strategy, if the fees are not paid. So the mechanism to receive those funds to be provided to the Olean Walker uh, loan fund, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, we are going to um, create a process so that it is uh, not difficult to pay off the fee in order to become compliant. And then I can hit on, sorry, yeah, I know what you mean by the third one. Um, so, yeah, and I want to provide a little bit more context to these. So first, on the Transportation Investment Fund, um, I think they put a little bit more money into that this year, but as of last year, that fund was about $700 million. This is the primary funding tool for big capital improvement projects for transportation, so that's a pretty significant incentive or disincentive, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, the third piece is a new bill this year, Senate Bill 260, reauthorized the fifth quarter local option transportation levy. Um, this is a county imposed levy that uh, as of May 2nd, municipalities will be able to access a share of if the county imposes it. And for the municipalities who have to submit a moderate income housing plan, if you're one of those 83, then you need to, if, you, if you're not compliant, you cannot access that that portion, your uh, 0.1%. So that's a significant amount of money as well. If every county in the state were to impose this this levy, I'm not sure how many rural communities will, but if every county imposed it, that's a total of $44 million. So another significant chunk of transportation money that has a fewer um, strings attached than the Transportation Investment Fund. But again, these are really meaningful incentives or disincentives and really important that communities work hard to comply. I'll mention that Christina this and her team has been an excellent resource. There's definitely been implementation hiccups, but we're confident that we'll keep working through it. Municipalities are taking action, so it's just a matter of getting everybody on the same page, trying to stay up to date with all the different changes, because I think in um, five years of these statutes, we've changed it every year. So um, yeah, a lot of learning opportunities, and we're getting there. <laughs> Carson and I haven't. No, it yeah, we isn't. haven't. That's good clarification. <laughs> um, so wanted to be very clear. There are three penalties, and uh, we hope for much success this year with the reports. HB 364 also changed um, the state of Utah low-income housing tax credit. I'm not going to steal David's thunder, so I'm just going to breeze over that. And then we have some new... Oh. I don't have thunder. <laughs> Sorry. He's got a lot of thunder. He's, <laughs> um, we do have some new reporting requirements. These are really just providing more transparency to various interim committees, as well as uh, through the Department of Workforce Services annual report. 
HB 406. Um, if you're bored anytime, you can just raise your hand and say, be done. Uh, so this one, <laughs> like, yeah, I, I got called being nerd. I was nerding out in the last presentation. So this one adds um, more information to the rural property definition. I know some of these things have already been highlighted this year. It talks about annexation, when and when it's not appropriate, lot line adjustments. I know everybody's really excited about that. If you want to get into the technicalities, we can dig in. Um, one of the things that was brought up, I, Dr. Nelson brought up, I thought you said 45 or 42 foot roadway. Uh, 32 is now the maximum in the state with a bunch <clears throat> of caveats. So your, your planning team, whether it's your internal planning team or the regional planners that you're working with in your AOGs, you'll really want to be um, focused on that when it's appropriate. Development agreements, there is a new clause in the development agreement language. You as a municipality, if you're entering into a, a development agreement, need to highlight what rights you are taking away from the party that you're entering into the development agreement with. I'll have Paxton talk about this. He's already nodding. <laughs> so you as a municipality need to identify the rights that you're giving away that are, vest that are state vested um, rights. If you don't, then that part of your development agreement is null and void. Very important. Moratoriums, again, and land use regulations, and um, really it's called the stacking effect. So you don't want a development to be subject. I didn't do a thing. The code has been changed, so you don't have the stacking effect. So moratorium after moratorium, so a perpetual uh, postponement of a development would be the best way to put it. And then landscape, landscape assurances. And this is really. Uh, there was a, there's been some disagreement if it's private property or public property and HOAs in particular, what needs to be finished before um, certificates of occupancy are issued. So this, this clarifies that. I know. HB 174 also it created that penalty. So if you're ever interested in reading the, the language, it's actually in SB 174. Um, the Lo Olin Walker housing loan fund is our, it's a, it's a small fund, but we received some federal funds as well as state funding. And then we did, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some additional funding that we received this legislative session. But what we do is we provide gap financing primarily for projects that David and I both work on in the grander scheme of things, which hopefully he, he talks about in the low income housing tax credit space here in a minute. Um, but these are really important funds. We do provide them as typically zero to one and a half percent interest rate loans. We sometimes do surplus cash flow loans. We make the we try to make the deals work with that very last piece of funding that needs to come into the equation. It also provides a streamlined subdivision process. I'm not getting into that. I think that is we've talked about that at great length. And then the internal accessory dwelling units, um, garages. Now you can have an IADU in a garage if you have a common wall. Uh, there were internal connectivity issues that were brought up. Some of the cases that um, I've heard about are, are quite comical. So we clarified what your internal accessibility can look like. Um, architecture, you have to match the character of the, of the uh, single family residential area. You can't create new you can't require pink crystals on the home now because they're building an AD, IADU. Like, not that any of you would. Nobody's laughing. It's fine. That was a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, parking. So you can require as a municipality up to one new parking stall um, for an IADU property unless your local code calls for four uh, parking stalls. If you have four parking stalls or above in your code, you can't pro you cannot require one more. So that's clarified. And then new builds, you can't prohibit IADUs being built in new builds. It's also a double counting issue. And I will tell you a story on this one. There was a municipality that had, um, and I'm I'm going to make up the numbers so nobody can identify it that there was a 100 unit subdivision. And so uh, the homes were starting to be built and the majority of them started to be built with internal accessory dwelling units. The municipality started counting every home with an internal accessory dwelling unit as two homes. So now your 100 lot subdivision, you're gonna get 50 homes out of it, which isn't really a good practice. So this, this actually prohibits that. Can I add one uh, clarification there? Yes. So um, for those of you who remember uh, House Bill 82 and 20, was that 2021? I think 2021. Sure. 
Um, that bill allowed municipalities who didn't have large um, public colleges or universities to carve out 25% of their geographic land mass, um, and the IADU preemption does not apply there. You had to do it by a certain time, I think it was October of that year. Um, the, the intent there was that if you had older neighborhoods where the infrastructure was really, really limited for existing development and you didn't have the capacity to serve an IADU and potentially every home, um, that, that was kind of the tool there. Um, some communities were, were using it for new subdivisions, so what the law says is, uh, like Christina mentioned, you can't use it for new builds, but it's only, um, it only applies to subdivisions that are platted after, I think, was it 2019? 2019. Or 21, yeah, it was, it was a couple years ago, so it was retroactive, but just, just be aware that um, if you're using that 25%, it no longer applies to subdivisions that are platted after the bill took effect. So just so a little So your rezone from ag to RA, whatever it's gonna yep. be, is, it doesn't apply. Um, thank you, Carson. Uh, HB 231. Uh, low-income housing property tax credit. So this is primarily for those uh, developments that are 30% serving 30% AMI and below, and they have to be in service for, I believe it's 15 years. There's a number of different clauses, but this is a really good thing. I want to just take a quick pause to talk about this 30% AMI and below demographic. These households are, are very difficult to house because the rent flow for any development is so um, de minimis. So what we have to do as a state and together through our programs as well as with the Office of Homeless Services, we have cobbled together a number of different funding sources in order to make these projects flow and also have case staffing because if you are familiar with the homeless population, it's very difficult to transition them from living on the streets with the majority of them with some health concerns um, or addictions. So we really are working as a state to promote not only housing them in their own homes, well, for a rent product, but also providing those case services. So one of the programs or the, the tax credit that David's gonna talk about really does support that particular demographic. But this is yet another um, uh, incentive so that the, the cash flow isn't as constrained on these properties. HB 499, homeless services amendments. There are a variety of things from the shelters that are being addressed to our critical care. Um, I can get into that if anybody's interested, but I'll probably just breeze over that. And then we have SB 199 with the local land use amendments. Uh, significant affordability uh, all appropriations, over $75 million was allocated. 50 of that is one time, the rest of it is ongoing for uh, homeless services, deeply affordable housing, and attainable housing grants. 10 million for the Utah Housing Preservation Fund. Is anyone familiar with that fund? Uh, this is our fourth appropriation, I believe, to this particular fund. And what this group does, it's, um, uh, it's Utah Nonprofit Housing. And uh, the Utah Housing Preservation Fund goes in and looks for projects that are, their deed restrictions are falling off. And we're trying to keep the folks in those particular uh, buildings, apartment buildings and developments in their, their units. We go in and um, invest in them. This is usually a four to one ratio with philanthropic dollars. So it's a really good return on investment. These properties then remain affordable. They're also updated. So it's a, it's a great thing. Historically, these affordable housing developments have been peppered throughout our communities and you may or may not know where they are. Unfortunately, as we as infill and as development has occurred, it's very difficult to place affordable housing developments statewide and peppered throughout our communities. So you, you see them kind of aggregate in certain areas. So it's really important for us to ensure that we keep many of these developments peppered throughout our communities as well as develop new ones. Uh, we also have some a shelter, a crisis shelter and transitional housing, shared equity revolving loan fund. I will say that representative, former representative Waldrop, if you are familiar with him, he was on the Commission for Housing Affordability. This is a program that he will be um, instrumental in and it's to be announced what that particular program looks like. These are all brand new, so I'm sorry, I'm trying to work through all the funding appropriations, but this is one of them. Um, we have the $4 million we discussed for the technical assistance to help everyone with the subdivision piece. Uh, $2.75 million, this is exciting for me. $2.75 million is going to go to rural Utah for um, land. And this is to get utilities to parcels, to help 
purchase lots. We do a lot with uh, the USDA and the self-help program, the crown program. We're tr really trying to get some for uh, sale moderate income housing throughout rural Utah. So this is the first time that this program has been available and it's ongoing, which is very exciting. So we'll be working with the AOGs, we'll be working with the Crown program, which is run through the Utah Housing Corporation, and with our local representative, Michelle Weaver, with the USDA, and we're gonna use these funds um, to the best that we can to get as many people in four purchase homes as possible. Uh, we have a new pilot program. I'm losing my breath here. Um, I, run, I run a number of different programs, and one of them is the State Weatherization Program. A lot of our homes that are naturally occurring affordable homes, we as weatherization cannot go in and modify because there are other deficiencies in the home. Say there's a hole in the roof. There's no reason for us to come in and do your windows and insulate your home if you have water flowing into your living room. So this is a really, really cool concept and I hope that the indicators that we show to the legislature will provide um, enough backing to get this to be an ongoing program. So we can, with this particular funding stream, go in and fix the roof and then our weatherization money, which we have a lot through the new infrastructure, federal infrastructure fund, then we can go in and sure up that home so it's energy efficient and the people living in it can remain living in it, which is exciting. I find it exciting. Um, we have constantly worked with the veterans, um, first time homeowner program. Again, this is a program that the Utah Housing Corporation runs. And then I also run the um, Section 8 Landlord Incentive Program. It's very difficult to house people with vouchers, so this provides an insurance policy for all intents and purposes. Again, I'm not gonna steal the thunder, that's why I'm turning this over to David for this particular slide. The end. <laughs> yeah, I guess we can just move it over. It's on this side or the other. Functional. We're functional. Is it everywhere? Christina, I just kind of in a daze wondering how you're going to get all of that stuff done, looking at that list of programs. Um, amazing work that's done in housing and community development. and. Um, at Utah Housing Corporation, we're super thankful for the team at, at Housing and Community Development. We're like sibling agencies, and, and we have the, the privilege to work closely together. And um, thank you for having us, and uh, I'm excited to be here. And I'll try to move quickly through this. When I attend conferences, this is what I call nap time. And uh, so, I just want to tell you, I'm not going to judge you if you start nodding off. Uh, I'll try not to do that to you. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you have children living in your basement? Okay. Like children that shouldn't be living in your basement. <laughs> How many of you have parents, your parents living with you? Okay. How many of you have total strangers living in your house? Okay. How many of you live in St. George? And, and how many of you would be willing to have a total stranger join you in your house? Because I'm looking for a southern base here, <laughs> and I can't afford to buy a house in St. George, be honestly. Careful. Yeah, no, ta yeah, let's talk later. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> um, really quickly, Utah Housing Corporation is the state's housing finance agency. Every state has at least one. And um, this is just to give you a feel for who we serve, and we, we, we really, uh, across the full spectrum. On the left there, you see permanent supportive housing, which is what Christina was talking about, 30% and below of AMI. These are people that are generally chronically unhoused, have severe uh, psychological and or substance abuse issues and difficulties, and they need significant uh, clinical support to, to um, achieve and maintain stability. And uh, so we're, we're in, that, in that game, so to speak, with some of the tax credits that we allocate. 
we are the state's allocator of the federal low-income housing tax credit, and there's also, as, as um, Christina pointed out, there is a state low-income housing tax credit, and I'll talk a little bit more about that because it was uh, expanded with HB 364. In the middle there, you see workforce housing. That's, that's something that we get involved in along with Christina and her team with tax-exempt private activity bonds and with 4% uh, federal low-income housing tax credits. And we are the Utah Housing Corporation is the conduit issuer of the bonds for those developers that receive what we call volume cap, or they're basically authorized by Christina's team to receive and to be able to use proceeds of tax exempt bonds uh, as part of the capital stack to finance these these projects. And then at the far right, we're we're in the home ownership game as well. We're helping young families achieve home ownership for the very first time. We provide down payment assistance to Utahns and their families. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit, and we'll talk in, in just a little bit of detail about SB 240 and, and how that thing's gonna work or how we hope it's gonna work. Um, I'm gonna start with home ownership. You've all been reading the news, and uh, I was fascinated by Dr. Nelson's conversation, and um, I found parts of it pretty depressing. Um, I, I, it's not gonna get better with my conversation, I promise you. Uh, no, no, there's, uh, the legislature has never stepped up like this before, really, and you'll see that in a minute when we talk about the magnitude of, of some of these financial commitments, but um, you all know purchase prices have been rising uh, rapidly along with interest rates, unfortunately. So I just wanted to share with you this data from Utah Housing Corporation because we have a mission focus on low and moderate income individuals and their families. So this is the demographic of your young children probably that are starting their career, like it or not. They're, they're probably in this category of low and moderate income when they start out. And this is what they've been faced with uh, since 2019. Uh, in 2019, the average purchase price that we financed, uh, we buy these first mortgages we service them, we have a mortgage servicing division, and then we resell the mortgages to investors, okay? And so, um, the average mortgage that we bought in 2019 was 238,000 and change. And now it's 376,000 to 11. Average income, uh, needless to say, with these prices rising, we like to say that we serve low and moderate income, but every one of us, including Christina's team, Habitat for Humanity, we talked to them and we're all bemoaning the fact that we're skewing. It's getting harder and harder to adequately serve low-income individuals because of, of inflation and, and other factors. And so we find that at Utah Housing Corporation, we're helping fewer and fewer truly low-income folks. If you're truly low-income, um, you probably can't afford to buy a home. Maybe you can afford to buy a condo or a townhome. Uh, but you can see here that, that the average income of the household that we are financing a mortgage for has jumped to over 93,000 when it was uh, just over 62,000 in 2019. Um, so how about our productivity as a supporter of, of helping people to you know buy their first home? Well. Sad news, right? Uh, we've been clipping along at over 4,000 units per year, 2019 through 2021. Things started to fall off in 2022. You'll you'll not be surprised by that. And year, fiscal year to date, this is uh, with our June 30 fiscal year. Fiscal year to date, we're at 1,411, and we we hope we might crack 2,000, but in all likelihood, we'll probably end up at around 1,900 units is what we're projecting. So um, all of us that are in this, in this business of, of attacking and, and trying to solve this affordable housing crisis, we're all seeing our resources and our efforts frustrated and blunted. Um, and this is what we're experiencing at Utah Housing Corporation and, and trying to help people achieve home ownership. It's, it's kind of a dismal picture. SB 240, I guess it was, uh, it was talked about a little bit earlier. Yeah, um, I can just jump through this really quick and, and take questions as you have them. Uh, this was uh, really President Adams and his inspiration, his vision. He's a, a developer, as you might know, and before he uh, was a developer per se, he was a home builder back in the, back in the 80s and 90s. 
And uh, he was remembering that, that we had some similar macroeconomic dynamics in play in the late 80s and early 90s. And he was also remembering that Utah Housing Corporation did some special things back then. And uh, he basically called us and said, can we do some special things again? And um, so uh, we worked through the session on, on SB 240, and this is what we came up with. It's a $20,000 per transaction soft second. So no payments, no interest. It's not a grant. Uh, when, when the home is refinanced or sold, uh, the money comes back. So this will get the person into the home, hopefully. Um, we think in this market, the primary uh, hurdle, the primary uh, problem for so many prospective home buyers is interest rates and payments. Um, and so we suspect that the majority um, of transactions will, will involve a permanent rate buy down. You can see in the third bullet point this can be used for permanent rate buy down closing costs or down payment assistance. You have a question, yes? So the, the real question is why only new construction? Oh, that's when there are so many other options available for first time home buyers. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So uh, if you've been listening to legislators the last year um, they uh, they've all been talking about the the very rudimentary economics of, of the supply demand imbalance that we have we have a drastic deficit in terms of supply that's not the only cause of the problem but that's a primary cause of the problem and so when you when you allocate resources to a demand stimulative program you're exacerbating the problem or arguably. And President Adams was very mindful of that. He did not want to exacerbate the problem. He was also aware that at Utah Housing Corporation, we provide down payment assistance. If a, if a primary barrier to home ownership is lack of a down payment, we've been solving that for years. We provide down payment assistance in the form of a second mortgage, fully amortized, 30 year fully amortizing. And so uh, he said, what we need to do is attack demand and be demand supportive, but we also need to uh, stimulate supply. And he's, he, I, he voiced what I've perceived as a kind of a frustration with uh, builders, and, and you can't blame builders for not wanting to step out and take extraordinary risks in this environment with uh, uh, rising interest rates and so forth, and inflation, and supply chain disruptions. But uh, he wanted to have this program incentivize builders to build affordable product. And so that's, uh, that was his thinking. And um, the types of products that are eligible include condos and townhomes. And there are such uh, products out there on the market that are available for 450000 or less. Um, so that was the rationale, is let's try to attack and it, it's hoped that this will spark and trigger builders in a, in a particular direction, uh, working with municipalities to, to do a lot of the things that Dr. Nelson talked about. Can we work with smaller lots? Can we uh, deal with, with greater density? And um, so that's, that's President Adams' hope uh, for the program. And there is some fungibility or flexibility on the purchase price limit. Uh, there, we can, there's like an annual reset uh, opportunity there. And uh, program resources can be used in conjunction with Utah Housing Corporation's regular down payment assistance. So those two things combined can be pretty powerful. You might be aware that uh, la in, in the 2022 general session, uh, there was appropriated $5 million to a grant program for law enforcement and corrections officers. And that program also can be used in conjunction with uh, Utah Housing Corporation's regular down payment assistance. And in fact, we've seen about 50 or 60% of those um, taking advantage of that grant program also utilizing Utah Housing's down payment assistance. So we think that there'll, there'll be some takers uh, with this program as well as far as uh, taking advantage of our down payment assistance. Any other questions on the program? Yes. It's just a hard limit. The question was, is there anything magical about 20,000? It's just a hard limit. Um, we, we, in consultation with President Adams, we talked about 
how much would be needed to move the needle. And we did talk a lot about this hypothetical scenario of permanent rate buy down and what is the average home buyer faced with, with the average mortgage rate, and what does it take to really uh, boost pro uh, affordability, and, and that's sort of how we arrived at, at 20,000. Yes? Yes, townhomes and condos are, are eligible. Is there an income qualification? Yes. Um, Utah Housing Corporation, we, we don't have anything in statute that sets a, there's not a bright line, but we generally, there are, there are income limits. Are there any mortgage lenders here? So I'll just say that regular income limits that uh, apply to our, our normal programs are in effect for this program. Generally, we see, we serve, on average, historically, people that are about 70% of area median income. And we've always taken great pride in that. That tells you that we are helping low and moderate income families. That skew that I mentioned earlier is happening in our average uh, household, our average home buyer now is more like 85 to 90 percent of AMI, but the people that we help are actually up to about 120 or 130 percent of area median income. And, and so, Christina, help me uh, for Salt Lake County, family of four, AMI is 100 and over 100 and 102 or something like that. So, in Salt Lake County, you could you could have a household that's taken down 120. 130,000 kind of thing at the high end. We're, we're definitely, we, we have a, a statutory mandate to focus our mission, you know, we're mission uh, oriented and, and we're focused on low and moderate income households. I Other, had a question. Uh, yes. Um, she gave me the microphone. David, um, I may need to have a conversation with you offline, but, and I may, I'm going back a couple slides or maybe you're gonna hit it next, but, um, I'm working with a developer that just in the last couple of weeks has told us in our community that his Utah housing credit or corporation or the credits he's received aren't going to allow him the, to build the project that we were hoping to get. And he's going to come back and build a smaller project now based on bids and the cost of construction and the increase going up and up. But now we're on a downward cycle. We're going back down, but interest rates have gone up. Mm -hmm. That's concerning to us um, because if you grant a density, you put a zoning in place and you allow for things to occur and, and they get that density because they're doing truly affordable housing because we don't have that yet. And then they come back and say, we can't do it. The tax credit funding isn't there. We can only build half of what we thought. That's a disappointment. And, and, and so maybe I need to talk to you offline about this particular situation because I need Definitely. to follow up with my council and mayor. And you said there, there's ta a tax credit involved in yes, the project. Yes, it's okay. in Santa Clara City. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to do that, yeah. So just so everyone's aware, one of the constraints that uh, David and I face in the 4% tax credit arena is the private activity bond allocation. Just really quickly to illustrate the, the capital stack, if you will, to get one of these apartment buildings built or run for rent town home projects. Private activity bond is uh, limited. It's federally limited, so we only have a certain amount of allocation. That's roughly 260 a year, I think, is what we average, David. Is that about right? That sounds about right, so, yeah. So we're partners in crime on this. Unfortunately, the feds require at least 50% of that project to be funded by private activity bonds. We're usually funding about 52, 54% because of those overages and unders that are happening. Can't even talk. It's starting to get late in the afternoon. Um, then the 4% tax credits come in. So the private activity bond, it is, a, it is a loan. It is not direct equity. That's when David comes in with his 4%. And that makes up maybe another 30% mm -hmm. of the project. And that's direct equity. So those are really great credits to get. But can't again, you can't access them unless you have the 50% PAB. Because we're limited, that limits the number of projects we can develop. Private activity bonds are, are, we get a four to one request. So for every $4 that's requested, we can give about a dollar. So some projects that initially get allocation from us, if they can't make their projects pencil and we don't have any more allocation to give, David's shop can't give anymore because federally we have to do it and they have to, then they'll be pushed to the next cycle. So I just want to tell you, as you're working with these folks in your community, there are things behind the scene. You may only be getting one side of the equation. 
we're happy to talk about the project. He's got a, a mastermind on his team, Claudia O'Grady, and we can give you the detail behind why certain things aren't happening. So that's my suggestion. Uh, there's an Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act that's been introduced and reintroduced several times in the past couple of Congresses that will be reintroduced in the current Congress. Uh, Congressman Blake Moore uh, signed on as a co-sponsor in the last Congress. Uh, we, I just spoke with his staff yesterday, and, and it's safely presumed he'll, he'll sign on as a co-sponsor once again. I'm working with uh, other members of our delegation to get uh, additional support. That, of, that particular piece of legislation, uh, Christina mentioned the 50%, you know, the requirement that uh, projects funded with 4% low-income housing tax credit, and I'm sorry, this is icky, but um, right now there's a, a requirement that 50% of the project be funded by these tax-exempt private activity bonds. The Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act uh, lowers that to 25%, so we could, we could do more projects uh, if we could see that done. There was also a temporary increase uh, in, the st in all states' allocations of the 9% federal low-income housing tax credit that was passed into law back in 2018. It was, it was temporary, it expired, and this Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act uh, seeks to reinstate or maintain that 12.5% boost to the 9% tax credit. So uh, those of you that are in, in regular contact with members of your congressional delegation, if you want to get more detail on these things from me that you can share with them, uh, by all means, I've, got, I've brought my business cards, and the more of us that are, never has our legislature been more focused on housing, and I think this, the same can be said about our congressional delegation, too. Even good conservatives who might think that housing isn't really a government thing, uh, of course it is, in one way or another, and uh, it's more important now than ever. Was there, an, was there another question? Yeah. I'm really slow. So am I, like, you're getting like 60 to 65% of the funding to, provided by you guys as the developer? Is that, am I, am I getting those numbers kind of right or? Say that again. You're, so you're, all this money's coming to the developers is what you're talking about. And it's like, so you've got like 50%, 25%, so like around 60, 75% coming to the developer to build the development. Is that, I'm, I'm, I'm really not following what you're saying. I, 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 I yeah, I, I have a little, Diagram, I'll talk through the tax credit briefly. That might help a little bit. I'll get to that here in just a sec. Any other questions? No? Okay. Um, Christina mentioned HB 231. Just to expand on it, we work very closely with Representative Elison on this one. It's true, if you, if you look at things nationally, it's true that many states outright exempt all tax credit housing properties from property tax. It's not the case here in Utah, partly due to Article 13, Section 3 of the Utah Constitution. Uh, our Constitution is pretty prescriptive about what can or cannot be exempted from property tax, and this particular section says property owned by a nonprofit entity used exclusively for religious, charitable, or educational purposes can be exempt. One of the rubs of tax credit finance is that uh, the federal, in, the investor in federal low-income tax credits uh, becomes a 99% owner, and they're, they tend to be for-profit entities. And so for tax reasons, they have to be a 99% owner for 15 years, and then they step out and hand the property to who, you know, whatever nonprofit's operating it. And this, again, this is a permanent support of housing. This is the most vulnerable in our community. So we definitely don't want to be burdening them with any any cost that, that, that we don't have to. And so all that HB 231 did is it provided that a private owner of a permanent supportive housing uh, project qualifies as a nonprofit entity as described in the Constitution, and it aligns the definition of permanent supportive housing with uh, definitions in U.S. Code, Code of Federal Re Regulations, and the Qualified Allocation Plan that we at Utah Housing Corporation use to administer the tax credit. So it just, it's a definition. Um, not a lot of money here. We're talking six figures statewide. Uh, one of my good friends, uh, a county tax assessor who's dialed into this, uh, did an estimate on the impact uh, that would be felt in his county. You probably heard this in the, in the committee presentation, Christina. He, he said that uh, he had to go to the third decimal uh, point to, uh, you know, 
quantify the, the impact, it's very, very small. But the, the beneficial impact for a permanent supportive housing project is, is huge because, again, these are uh, projects that are providing significant support to very, very vulnerable people. So it's, it's a great, uh, great bill. Super happy about that one. Um, HB 364 increases the state's low-income housing tax credit 10 times. Uh, it has a six-year sunset. Just to run you through the tax credit really quick. Created in 1986, signed into law by President Ronald Reagan. Uh, it attracts private capital investment into the rehabilitation or construction of affordable housing. Since this federal low-income housing tax credit has been in existence uh, here in Utah, we've financed over 38,000 units with it. It's by far the biggest driver of affordable housing. So this is the mechanism. Uh, Utah Housing is the allocating agency. Uh, we allocate those tax credits to the developer, and the developer in turn sells those tax credits to an investor. And the money that the proceeds of the, the investor's investment go into the project, and the investor comes in as a partner to the project. That's it in a nutshell. There's some differentials in credit pricing and other kinds of things like that that I will not get into. We can. Uh, what's that? We can. It's boring. Yeah. No, it... <laughs> it <sighs> uh, I think I've bored them sufficiently already. Just really quick, the low-income housing tax credit is interesting. It's a 10-year credit. So if a, a, an investor buys a credit and it's $100, they, I, I like to use the analogy of a punch card. If you have a 10-punch punch card, you get to walk up to the state tax commission every year for 10 years and say, here, punch this for 100 bucks. Of course, we usually allocate it in larger uh, increments than $100. But um, the point that I need to make here is that the investor receives a benefit over 10 years. So there's a real time value of money component here for the investor. Um, the cost to taxpayers is deferred. You're giving up tax revenue, but you're giving up tax revenue over the course of 10 years, okay? So it, we're helping taxpayers to buy affordable housing on an easy 10-year payment plan is one of the ways to think about it. And we're, we're bringing private investors and private developers into play, and they're taking development risk as well as financial risk. So it's a great public-private partnership. Um, and just to the problem, um, our deficit of, of affordable units, over 40,000. Um, and um, we know the impact on economic growth. Um, I'm just showing you a recently completed um, affordable housing project up in Ogden. You see that little 1.07% slice at the top. That's a look, we did a look back over the last five years at the state low-income housing tax credit. The orange segment is the federal low-income housing tax credit. And on average, the federal low-income housing tax credit is injecting from that investor investment 48% of the total costs of construction. The federal LIHTC is big. It's a big mover. The state tax credit over the last five years has provided 1.07%. It's been just kind of a gap funding vehicle. So this was, this was kind of our pitch was the state you know, could step up and, and really make a much greater impact with a, a bigger program. And so we asked for uh, the program we have historically, we call it a $1 million program. Uh, it's, it's been increased to a $10 million program. And we look forward to seeing somewhere between 600 and 700 new units, we hope. That's dependent, of course, on inflation and, and cost of construction. But as we were talking to policymakers, we, we shared with them this graph that sort of shows the units produced are the red bars. And you can see the growth over time in units produced. The gray line is the deferred growth of foregone revenue. And you see that it's flat from 2023 to 2025 or 26. That's because uh, tax credits can't be claimed by the investor until the project is in service. It takes a few years to get these projects up and, up and running. The gray plateau is uh, the private investor's investment, which comes up front. This is, an, as I said, the taxpayer gives up tax revenue over 10 years. Um, the investor comes up, comes in on day one with that purchase of tax credits, and then they have to wait 10 years to sort of receive the benefit of those tax credits they've they've acquired. With that, did that help at all on tax credits? Little, maybe. Any other questions? I didn't see anybody fall asleep. 
I do see I do see a few blank stares, and I don't blame you. Yes. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious on the population. I'm from a small community, small city. Population is about 2,500 people. I've actually just worked with uh, Chelsea Hunt from your corporation for two houses that was built in our city. Uh, but I'm having a hard time understanding that this, how does this apply to population? Are you talking about smaller rural markets? Yeah. Um, so in the interest of time, I focused on, I applied kind of an 80-20 rule, I guess. You know, 80% 80 or 90% of what we're going to produce is going to be in Washington and, and Salt Lake and Utah and Davis counties and so forth. Um, as Christina mentioned, there are a number of things that are going on in rural. Rural is, I think rural is more challenging than urban in a lot of ways. Um, Christina mentioned, we have this crown program, uh, Utah Housing. Uh, we, th there's a 9% low income housing tax credit that's out, there's an allocation each year. It's based on population like the private activity bond volume cap. And we set aside 5% of those tax credits for crown. And maybe some of you have heard of the crown program. It, it's, it doesn't, doesn't generate a lot of units. We tend to have maybe 50, 60, 70 units at a time that we're able to, to be working on. Um, the challenges are, are not just financial, but also, of course, um, workforce. Um, getting developers and builders to take interest in rural markets. Um, there's sad reality is there's a whole lot more money to be made in the urban markets, and that's where the developers are focusing their energies. But um, Christina and her team are probably moving the needle more than anybody on rural. And um, we have a, a budding partnership with the Habitat for Humanity of Summit County. Uh, we're talking to Habitat of Salt Lake Valley, and there's like five more Habitat for Humanities around the state. And we're hoping that maybe we can expand our reach by uh, doing some more things uh, in support of Habitat for Humanity, because I think they have a little bit of impact in rural communities that, that maybe we can help with. Other than that, Christina on rural. You know, some of the opportunities that we're going to look at with this new funding stream, although it's small right now, are layering. Uh, if, the, if the municipality or a special service district or if CITLA, for all in, <laughs> I don't know if they would ever do this, wanted to provide land that's owned by that uh, government entity for affordable housing, it doesn't need to be at market value. So that's an incentive in the state of Utah. We'd like to layer that with the this particular up to 25,000 is roughly what we're probably going to do per lot for this $2.75 million. The terms, again, we're going to structure it through the Olean Walker lo uh, Loan Fund. We have extremely beneficial terms. We can pair that with the Crown Program, with the USDA financing. So we're going to work with the AOGs to get out to the communities and look at what can we do to um, to get these lots available. Okay. I have one, I won't say the particular municipality, but they. They went in, they purchased the land, they've got about 20 lots, and about 15 years ago, they finalized all of the utilities, but they're not actually up to code, so they have to go back in and redo those utilities and stub them to, the, to where the building envelope is going to be. And those are the types of things that these new funds can be utilized for, so that the lot is development ready for all intents and purposes. So we'll see. We're, we're hoping that this will gain some traction, and if it does, then we'll get, I'm sure we'll get um, kudos from the legislature as they are very interested in single family home ownership, especially mm -hmm. in rural Utah. Really quickly, there's an interesting, interesting thing happening in Moab. Um, if there's anyone here from Grand mm -hmm. County uh, would know about this, there's a, a Moab area community land trust. It's about 42 acres. There's a, a woman that just um, contributed this land into a land trust. Land trusts are there to provide affordable housing in perpetuity. And we're working with that land trust on a, on a um, portfolio, I guess, of housing, uh, some multifamily tax credit financed, as well as some cottages that we're helping to develop and finance. Uh, so it's a, it's a mixture of single and multifamily. But uh, I just met uh, earlier this week with a, a group in Salt Lake that are interested in helping to incubate, promote, 
and support the, the creation of additional community land trusts around the state. I'm no expert, but we're trying to get our heads around it and, and see if there's some potential there. It's, it's more prevalent um, in, the, in the eastern part of the country. It's quite interesting to me that the, the land trust in Moab is either the largest or one of the largest in the country with 42 acres. Um, so the question is, can municipalities place land into community land trust, and is that part of the, part of the answer? You know, might that be part of the equation? Um, it would be interesting to see. So. Can you go back to that last slide one more time? So if I'm understanding this, just getting this tax credit thing, maybe this will clear my mind and if anybody else has the question. The developer gets the tax credit. They then take that tax credit, sell it to a corporation, somebody wants to prepay Utah taxes, somebody... What is the corporation's gain? Do they get extra credit from the taxes when they send it in, or is it just exactly what their state tax would have been anyway? There's two kinds. Um, some of them do it for purely financial reasons. They they want offset to profits, and they, they want tax credits for purely financial reasons. But a lot of, and, and historically, that's not been our mainstay. Um, that will probably be more of what we're seeing going forward because we're going to see more um, uh, diversity in investor types and more activity coming through uh, syndicators. What we've had historically have been more direct investment arrangements and the direct investors have been financial institutions. Um, if you're familiar with the Community Reinvestment Act, hopefully a few of you, maybe, no. Um, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act passed back in the 1970s compels banks to um, invest in uh, and support rural and distressed communities. And um, so, so banks have a regulatory motivator in the Community Reinvestment Act. And so banks, the private activity bonds that we issue, uh, banks will buy those. Uh, one of the ways that we fund our, our purchase of single family mortgages is we issue taxable bonds that are bought by industrial banks in Utah. And they're willing to take a, a little, slightly lower than market interest rate uh, in terms of the return that they see by investing in those bonds because they get CRA good good Boy Scout, Boy Scouts. They get CRA good Boy Scout credit for investing in affordable housing. That's one of the things that the, the CRA is com compelling banks to, to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That answered my second part. Is there a the CRA merit, ba merit badge? <laughs> there should be, I'm just saying. Personal finances suck, though, I'll tell you that. But anyway, so is that open to anybody to invest in and buy, or is that pretty much institutionalized? Uh, up until this point, we've had a, a handful of, of investors like American Express Bank, Goldman Sachs. Um, what we'll be seeing with our much larger program is more competition, and we'll see more investors from out of state, and, and there's a, a, a syndicator uh, it's not an industry. There's just a, a two or three of them, I think. But there are syndicators that will come in and, and buy and, and resell and manage and distribute these tax credits a little bit more dynamic. And we haven't had that activity in the market historically because our program was so small. So I can't claim to be an expert on what it's going to look like. We're going to learn a lot more in the next couple of years now with the expanded program. Question there? Just stretching? Are you falling asleep? I haven't asked a question for about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, just more from the rural perspective. You, um, Christina started with um, how we're keeping or holding cities accountable and saying, hey, cities are doing all the right things. But if we are a city, and we don't have a long history with other developers. Um, is there like a pre-vetted or is there a pool of resources or developers that you work with so we can bridge those gaps? Because what you just described, I'm pretty sure, you know, the, the small developers in our own community aren't even aware of the opportunities or the resources, you know, that, that you offer. Um, so it's similar in my mind, I guess, like we're doing a UDOT project we, our, our local contractors had to go off of a list because they're used to all of the regulations that come with a UDOT project versus 
the ones that do, do city projects, and they're not in that same game, if that makes sense. Right, so for the larger scale developments, there are, sorry about that, there are grading criteria built within both of our processes that vet some of the things. If, if they're not sufficiently developing a good product or maintaining it, we've had a couple projects like that, we will discount their grading score. Again, because our larger projects are competitive with that private activity bonding, that usually flushes out the ones that may not be performing up to our standards. For the smaller municipalities, um, we don't have a list, like the state procurement list is what you're talking about, where you can pick. We don't do that with developers. So what we're going to do is, we've got, it, we've got a concept, and I'll illustrate it for all of you. We've got a group of us, government, we're here to help, but it really is, it's the state planning office, my office, um, the governor's office of economic opportunity, and a few others. We've got U, UDOT and water representatives. We're starting with six county right now. We meet once a month and work on, we, we nail down which projects are the highest priorities in those, in that general um, AOG jurisdiction. And then we tag team and, and figure out what funding or what needs to be done. I, this will be embedded in that, this, the, the smaller developments in rural Utah for home builders. So we can talk about what do we need to do because it's difficult for me to have all of the municipalities contacting me and saying, well, now what's the next step? I can give some of the information, but my number one guidance right off the bat is get a really great attorney and then get a really great financial advisor. And this pertains not only to just the development of property, but also if you're doing community reinvestment areas, it's extremely important because there is a housing set aside that can also add to this layering effect to have, you need the best in the room. And they don't, they may not need to put 100 hours into your project, but you shouldn't be, I, I always, I, I can't emphasize this enough because there's so many out clauses in state code you want to make sure that you're 100% protected. So while we can help with the macro, when you get down to the micro and, ap and actually negotiating it on behalf of your municipality, that's where you really want to make sure you have the best in the business, especially with development agreements now. I want to emphasize that. Well, thanks to our panel. This has been a great session. We appreciate it. <laughs>